Hello, welcome to The Honest Wargamer. I'm your host, Rob, and this video is going to be a detailed rules breakdown for all of the Age of Sigmar 4 core rules. There's already some supplementary videos that I've made, for instance, how to build an Age of Sigmar 4 army list, which I'll link in the description below. But this is going to be a detailed walkthrough of all of the different rules. And this is going to be hopefully useful for new people and also experienced players, where I cover everything in detail, so you're going to be able to understand exactly what it means, and how to do it. Learning rules is super boring, so we'll try to make this as engaging as possible, but ultimately, if you want to learn the rules well, it's just going to take a while. I've tried to put subchapters in the links below, and you should be able to skip to the sections that you need and want, and hopefully be able to use this as reference in the future. And I hope you enjoy the video. Please do leave comments. If you do like it, like, subscribe, and if you'd like to support The Honest Wargamer, we have a Patreon with an active community, all interested in Age Sigma that you can join. Right, let's get straight into the basic concepts. Now, if you are an experienced Age Sigma player, you don't need this help. Uh, but this is going to be something that we need to immediately talk about. These are the core concepts that you're going to need. If you have never played Age of Sigma before and you need to know what you need, you're going to need a tape measure, right? You're going to need some dice. You're going to need two armies to play against each other. That makes sense. The first core concept that we're going to discuss is measuring. When you do measure, and we'll talk about movement later, and I'll try to put some examples up. When you do measure, obviously you measure from the bases of the models, not the models themselves. That's an important part. And sometimes things will be described or many abilities will be described as within or wholly within. And it does go on to describe because you won't believe this. At one point, there was a row on the internet for many de days about what wholly within and within meant. However, wholly within is simply the entire base is wholly within the range that it says. It's wholly within 12 inches, the whole base of the miniature and the unit is gonna to need to be within 12 inches in that example, okay? And then within is just a bit of the base is within or a bit of the unit with is in. Hope that's simple. Next up, dice. Dice, everyone uses D6s. So a six-sided dice to roll them. If someone says that you need to roll two D6, you roll two dice, that's two D6. Um, and when we, get, when we break down the war scroll in a moment, we'll talk about that more. Sometimes it will say that you need to roll a D3. A D3 is a certain type of dice, or you can roll a D6 and you can halve the result. So on a D6, a result of a one or two is going to be a one. A result of three or four is going to be a two, and a result of five or six is going to be a three. If you are trying to roll a D3 and get a result of a two plus, effectively, you are looking for a result, a result of three, four, five, or six, as opposed to a result of one and two. It's a little bit confusing, and they could have just said roll a D3 dice, and you could buy a D3 dice. But basically, the game is broken up into D6s, and D3s. And sometimes you roll 3D6 and sometimes you roll 2D3 as an example. And those are effectively the core concepts. They have also said that they will provide support for the game system via warhammercommunity.com, which is nice. And they've done that in something called FAQs. And sometimes they do balance patches as well. We don't know as of yet what their roadmap is for Age of Sigma 4 in that regard, but it is a game system that does get constant updates. Points for units, sometimes rules changes, and also every year a new mission pack that's what we get these are called battle packs and there is one in the core box for age of sigma 4 launch box it's called a general's handbook although it's a deck of cards so we've started calling it the general's hand deck but that is a set of rules that will run across a year does that make sense hope it does and if it doesn't please leave any questions uh, down below the most important rule is while you are playing age of sigma and this is always true when you're playing any tabletop game try to have fun that's simple. And if you and your opponent don't know what a rule is, you probably haven't watched this video, but also, <laughs> you also don't worry about it too much, especially if you're new. Just try and work it out and have a good time. It's basically what they're saying here, but the rules are pretty solid and there is no fringe cases. There might be some, but we'll get to them later. So all of the units that you're gonna play with in Age of Sigmar have points. And those are located initially in the battle packs, which are online PDFs that you can look at. And later on, they'll be either in your battle tomes or somewhere else. So all your units are condensed into rules. And those rules are located in something called a war scroll. So each unit that you can play in the game has its own unique and different war scroll. Um, and so we're going to look at the, just the elements of a war scroll now so you can understand how a war scroll works and just break down the anatomy of it. First one we're going to look at is Chaos Knights. Chaos Knights are a unit of five. And it, by the way, if you want to know how any of the armies army kind of special rules work then i've made loads of faction preview videos you can go and check out in detail and there's loads of information there 
Chaos Knights is a unit of five models. So when you do take a unit of uh, Chaos Knights, how many Chaos Knights can you take? It's a great question. There's something called a pitched battle profile, which again will be in an online PDF and eventually in your battle tome, which will tell you how big a unit size will be. But normally a unit size is exactly the same size as the box that you can buy. You buy a box of Chaos Knights and so it's five and therefore a unit size is normally five. That's normally all exactly the same. Okay, so five Chaos Knights. So let's have a quick look at a War Scroll and break down. Health is related in this top left-hand corner to the health value of each of the models that you get inside of a unit. So there are five models, so each one of those five models has got four health. Really easy. I hope that makes sense. We're going to talk about doing damage and everything else. Uh, but when a unit uh, takes damage, which is damage points, which you can see on this weapon profile here, you keep adding them up until you get four health, uh, sorry, four damage on a unit that will remove the health of one of the models, and therefore that model will die, sadly, RIP, that model. <laughs> uh, and that's how that works. The other stat at the top is the move value. You'll move those models, each individual model in a unit, up to a certain distance, and 10 inches is the furthest you can move it. You don't have to move it 10 inches, you can move it less, but that's how far you move it. There are other ways to move, there's gonna be loads, we'll break that down in a moment. It's also got a three up save. So a save is really interesting. When someone tries to do damage to you, you'll get a save that you'll do, and then you'll get to roll that. So someone says, I've done three damage, uh, I've done three wounds to you, then you will roll three dice, and then if you roll three up or better, you'll make a save, and the damage isn't going to go through. And we'll break this down later, but that's what your save is. Normally, lower is better. And then a control value. Each model in your unit will be worth a control value. So a unit of five Chaos Knights, each model in the unit is worth a control value of one. When you're trying to hold an objective, which is a certain place on the board, which we'll get to later, then those models will count for the control value for holding the objective. So there's five models in units, that's five lots of one. Therefore, your control score will be five. There's going to be a difference between your control value, which is per model, and your control score, which we'll talk to it in the, in the future. The next one is your weapons profile. So as you can see, Curse Lance, War Steed Hooves, it's got two weapons profiles. This does mean that when you're making an attacks with each individual model, you'll roll each one of those attack profiles, and then you'll roll it out. Uh, the number of attacks, or how many dice you'll roll, is written there. So Curse Lance, it's three. To hit, you'll need to roll a three up to hit. To wound, you'll need to roll a three up to wound. It's got a rend one, which a rend is going to, we'll talk about this later as well, that reduces the save value. So where it's a three at the top, rend one, which is minus one, is gonna make that a four up save. And so you only get a four up. Higher rend is better. Damage is how, many da how much damage that weapon does. We'll talk about that in a bit. And then the ability on the side, you, uh, weapons in this game sometimes have weapon abilities, right? And then uh, this does charge plus one damage. Super simple, right? This means that when this unit is charged, which we'll get to in a bit, you can add an additional damage to it. Uh, then the Warseed's Hooves have got two attacks per one, and then you roll them through. Then what you have beneath this is you have a bunch of special abilities that only apply to these units. Uh, and so the Chaos Knights, they have Impaling Charge. That's what they have. And then at the bottom you can see here that they have keywords. So the game is broken down into keywords. This is really important. The one at the very bottom is normally related, or the set of keywords at the bottom is related to the faction and the units that it's from. So as you can see, it's a chaos, which is a grand alliance. There are four grand alliances. Chaos, so just over there. Uh, chaos, order, destruction, and death. Let me know which your favorite is. Slaves of Darkness relates to the faction that they're a part of. So you're running a Slaves to Darkness army. And then Warriors of Chaos is a keyword because it's a warrior that's riding on the horse. On the top line, there's a bunch of keywords which relate to abilities and also some other stuff. Cavalry, as an example, is a unit subtype. Champion is an ability which we'll talk about in a moment. Musician and Standard Bearer. This is what we'll effectively known as a command group. Command groups are like individual models that you'll have in a unit, and they have their own special abilities. If you have a champion in a unit, then you're going to get to add one to the attack characteristic of weapons used by that champion in the unit. So your champion in a unit, if it's got three attacks, is now going to have four attacks. Really easy. You'll have a musician, 
in a unit as well sometimes. And again, you'll see those in the keywords at the bottom if you do or don't have them. And while this unit contains any musicians, if you use a rally ability, which we'll talk about in a bit, then you can add an additional dice when you do that ability. So we'll come back to that. So musicians and rally, they work together. And lastly, standard bearers. While this unit contains any standard bearers, you add one to this unit's control score. And don't forget the control score is a culmination of the control values added up together and then you'll add plus one. So if you've got a unit of five Chaos Knights, as we do, and they've all got a control value of one, that'll be a control score of five plus one for the standard bearer. And that's what the keywords at the bottom mean. So sometimes you'll have abilities which will work against certain units, like plus one against cavalry, that's where you'll see it at the bottom, and there'll be other keywords. So sometimes if you're like, oh, I wonder where that keyword is, it's located at the bottom. Now, that's Chaos Knights, which is quite a simple war scroll. If we start to get more complicated war scrolls, like Bellacore, you can see here, the 4-up armor save, which you have at the top, or the 4-up save that you have here, also has an additional save that you can have in the game called a ward save. You can see that just down here. A ward save is like an additional save that you can make in addition. It makes units much stronger and much more su survivable. But we'll talk about those in a bit. The fly keyword is reference to a certain type of move that you can do, and we'll talk about that later. And then wizard two, which is pretty big, yeah, means that it's a wizard and is going to be able to cast spells. And obviously, we'll break this down in the casting spell section later. But wizard two. It's also a monster, which um, is an interesting keyword because some units have special abilities against monster. It's a hero. It's unique and it's got Warmaster. A hero means you're gonna be able to use it. Uh, a hero means you're also gonna be able to use abilities against it. You're gonna be able to use it to unlock regiments, which please go and watch my video about how to build armies in Age of Sigmar 4. It's unique, which means you can only take one copy of it in your army. So you can only have one Bellacore. And then Warmaster means that if it's the only Warmaster in your army list, it has to be the general in your army. And that is what that means. It's also got access to a spell you can see here, which we'll cover later. Lastly, some units will also have the priest keyword, which is similar, like you can see on this war chanter, which is similar to a wizard. But we're gonna break that all down later when we talk about spells. We're gonna quickly just pop back to the Chaos Knights for a moment, especially for when you're building your miniatures if you're new to Age of Sigmar. You're gonna to say to yourself, oh, what is, the best what is the best weapon option for me to build? Well, actually, in Age of Sigmar 4, they've said that weapon options no longer matter. They don't care which one that you put on your model, and you can use it as anything. And that's normally true for almost all of the units. It's worth going and checking. Some units, like Kurnoth Hunters, will probably have a different war scroll for Kurnoth Hunters with bows versus Kurnoth Hunters with scythes. However, scythes and, and uh, swords might have the same profile. So uh, Varangard is another good example. Uh, spears are same as in sorcered weapons now. So don't worry too much. They've made it so that uh, they're not the same. Uh, that They are the same and you don't have to worry about which one you build. So the next thing we're going to talk about are abilities. In Age of Sigmar, everything that you do is considered an ability, okay? Everything. Moving is the move ability. Shooting is the shoot ability. Uh, so everything is a, casting a spell is a, using a spell ability. Even deploying your units on the board is using the deploy ability. Uh, <laughs> so everything that we're going to talk about now is in relation to abilities. We're going to cover what abilities are how they resolve, the rules of one. We're going to talk about the stack, which is kind of a term that they use in Magic the Gathering. And probably in a future video, we're going to make an entire video about abilities, ability stacks, and when they work. And I don't want you to get too intimidated because they're pretty simple. Like when you initially read them, there are just going to be some interesting cases for when you might want to use them like in more like detailed timing. Right, so here is the first example ability that they show. And this is the shoot ability. They do on the left hand side have a bunch of pictures which relate to like what the ability is like a little arrow is a move ability uh, Little cross swords is an offense ability. They also have timings based on color But those timings don't seem to be like key locked to the color So like the color doesn't specify exactly when it has to be so it's more of a guide versus anything else So looking at ability you'll see at the top the timing like when it's used. So we're gonna talk about timings a bit more, but this is used in your shooting phase. So there are two shooting phases in the game. There's your shooting phase and your opponent's shooting phase. So 
it specifies your shooting phase. Number two is the name and description, normally some flavor text of what the ability does. And then number three, quite importantly, is the declare, when you declare it. So all abilities you declare to do. I declare to move. I declare to shoot, as an example. This one, it says declare. You pick a friendly unit that has not used a run or retreat, and their key, you see how they're bolded? That means that they themselves are other abilities. Run is a run ability, and retreat is a retreat ability. Pick a friendly unit that has not used a run or retreat ability this turn to use this ability. Then pick one or more enemy units as the target or targets of that unit's attacks, which we'll talk about in a bit. So that's number three. And then the next is the effect. You resolve the shooting attacks against the target. Now, there are also going to be reactions which happen after the declare step, but we're going to talk about those in a bit. Okay, and beneath them, they have keywords. So you can see the keywords is core, attack, and shoot. Some abilities are a core ability. Moving is a core ability. Shooting, fighting are core abilities. And we'll talk about those a little bit later, but so you can never do, uh, we'll talk about those in the rule of one in a moment. Uh, so those are the keywords that you can see here. Right, Keywords let you know which abilities can be used or which units can be picked as targets for an ability. For example, the charge ability can only be used by a unit if it did not use the run or retreat keyword earlier in the turn. The singular and plural forms of a keyword are synonymous for rules purposes. So that's important. So using abilities, you can see here the timing of how this works. You have declare the ability, use reactions, and then resolve the effect. And we're going to talk about those in a moment. Uh, we'll talk about those now, actually. Tell your opponent which ability you're, you're using, and if the ability has the declare instructions, resolve them. Then use reactions. Starting with the active player, and we'll look at the example in a moment, the players alternate using any abilities with an appropriate reaction. So I declare I'm going to do something, I'm the active player, I then, de uh, I then uh, do a reaction, and then my opponent does a reaction. Super simple. Does that make sense? Good. And then you resolve the effect. So there are rules of one for abilities. A unit cannot use more than one core ability per phase. For example, many of the teleports that you're going to see in the game will have as a keyword, again, keyword located at the bottom of ability, that's a core. That means you're not going to be able to do two core abilities in the same phase, so you're not going to be able to do a teleport and then a move, as an example. So a unit cannot use more than one core ability per phase. A unit cannot use the same ability more than once per phase unless specified otherwise. So can't use the same ability more than once. And a unit cannot be affected by the same passive ability more than once at the same time. For example, if a unit is within range of two different terrain features that have cover, then the effect is only applied once. So you cannot affect a unit with two passives. However, what this doesn't state is that you can't affect a unit with an ability more than once. So as an example, the shoot ability is an ability. So if I pick a unit to shoot at it, I use the shoot ability, and then I use the shoot ability again with another unit, I can still target another unit. So a unit can be affected by an ability more than once, but cannot be affected by a passive um, more than once, if that makes sense. I hope that makes a lot of sense. Next, we're going to talk about passive abilities. And when we look at War Scroll again in more detail, there'll be passive abilities. So abilities that have the passive timing, so this is just here, um, the pass, uh, passive timing are called passive abilities. Passive abilities are not declared. The effects of passive abilities are always apply if the conditions of the ability are met and if they must be applied if it's possible to do so. So that's they're always on, basically. That's the situation, and they're always applied. We're going to talk about that in a minute. So simply, everything you do is an ability, and there is timings for all reactions to when those abilities work some abilities have keywords and we've covered multiple of those in faction previews so you go check them out and we'll cover them more again in the future there is an example in the rule, rule book of how this works and we're going to look at this now the first up is uh, we see that one of the units declare one of the players declares a fight ability right which is a core attack fight ability so they use the fight ability they pick a friendly unit that is in combat which is a status or that charge this turn to use this ability that unit can make a pilot move then if that unit is in combat it must pick one or more enemy units to be the target okay perfect so you've declared it you've done the declare steps that's step one now you do a reaction and as I'm the active player, whoever has decided they're going to fight, I declare to fight. That's what I'm going to do. I declare to attack. Then I'm going to do a reaction, which is all out attack, which is a command ability. We'll talk about command abilities in a bit, where you get plus one to hit. Then my opponent is like, I'm going to do a reaction as well. I'm going to do plus one to my save rolls. 
Super simple. And then you then move to the effect. So declare, react, react, and then you will resolve the effect. Super simple. OK, now we're going to get into the more advanced rules for ability rules. And this is going to be quite important, especially to all of the people who really love this kind of stuff, uh, because breaking down exactly when abilities happen in some cases might end up being quite complex. But there's going to be lots of people online who are going to be able to talk about those interactions. And in fact, I think a lot of people are going to be really excited about how those interactions are going to work and being able to try and work out exactly when they can put the right ability or reaction in against their opponent. So who is using an ability is an important thing that we need to cover. Most abilities are found on War Scrolls, but many appear elsewhere, the best examples being the universal core abilities. So those would be things like shoot and move. While abilities on War Scrolls are always used by the unit whose War Scroll it is, some abilities that do not appear on War Scrolls will tell you explicitly to pick a unit to use the ability. In both cases, it should be clear which unit is using the ability. So what they're saying is, we've covered all the bases, it should always make sense. Some abilities that do not appear on War Scrolls most commonly enhancements. So these are special items that you're going to be able to take that you'll find in your core, uh, in your battle tomes or your battle pack at the start of the game. They're kind of like they're kind of um, they're like enhancements to your army, like the special magic item or a special command trait or those sorts of things. That's what they are. Um, so some abilities that do not appear on War Scrolls, most commonly enhancements, are given to certain units in your army. In such cases, the unit in which the enhancement was given is the one using the ability. Super simple. So you basically give them an item, but you really are giving them an ability because everything's an ability. Abilities that neither appear on a War Scroll nor tell you to pick a unit to use the ability are used by you, the player. Not by the unit, you the player. And that's an important distinction. So either you're using the ability or the unit is using the ability. And finally, for the purpose of the rules in this section, when a rule refers to a player using the ability, this includes abilities used by units in that player's army. Okay. Now, I hope I haven't lost you there, okay? <laughs> I really haven't, but we're going to keep going on because these are the advanced rules, and these are fairly important to know and learn uh, to be able to absorb the information. And I promise you, once you put the miniatures on the table, it will make a lot more sense, and it will be really easy, okay? So, advanced ability rules. Unless stated otherwise, units using or picked as part of an ability must be on the battlefield. So if you've got an ability to do some damage, for example, you want to try and shoot, you can't shoot when you're off the board, Okay, why would I be off the board, Rob? Well, maybe a unit's dead, or you're going to put it in reserve, which we'll do it in a bit. Next up, if an effect states that a unit can do something, its commander, which is us, not our general, which is weird because they sell a general's handbook, but whatever, uh, its commander can choose whether to resolve that part of the effect or not. Okay? So when you get given the choice of this unit can do something, you get to choose whether or not you're going to do it. That's nice. In the opposite of that, if an effect states that a unit must do something, its commander has no choice and must resolve that part of the effect. If this is impossible, no part of the effect is applied, but the ability is still considered to have been being used. So in some cases, you can choose to do something. In some cases, you must do something. That's how abilities work. Okay. When this unit appears in an ability text, most often on War Scrolls, it means the unit that is using the ability is this unit, that unit there. If an ability affects more than one unit, the player who used the ability can choose the order in which units are affected by it. That's quite cool. That's quite simple. I'm doing effects. I choose in which order. When resolving an effect, if you need to roll a dice for multiple affected units, roll and resolve the effect for one unit before moving on to the next. And lastly, if an ability instructs you to pick more than one unit, each unit you pick must be different unit unless stated otherwise. It's quite an important distinction because sometimes it's like pick three units. And in some cases, you would think, oh, I can pick the same unit three times. But no, this is said it's got to be three different units every time. Hope that makes a lot of sense. OK, now we're going to talk about persisting effects. Some abilities have effects that aren't immediately resolved. As an example, you add one to save rolls for this unit for the rest of the turn, or this unit has a five up ward save for the rest of the turn. These effects count as effects of passive abilities for their duration. So when you apply a persisting effect on a unit, like plus one save, that is now going to be a passive effect 
until obviously it says it ends. So this becomes a passive. So sometimes you'll basically, sometimes you'll add a passive onto a unit, which is different to an active ability, something you activate. And we've covered passives already. Once per timings. Okay, this is pretty simple, but it sounds a bit long-winded. The timing part of ability say once per phase, once per turn, or once per battle. If the ability is used by a unit, it can be used a maximum of one time in that phase turn or battle so once per phase that unit can only use it once per phase once per turn that unit can only use it once per turn and once per battle that unit can only use it once per battle but rob what if i have two units that can use an ability once per phase and it's the same ability you can use both of them so let's say unit a has got an ability to be used once per phase you can do it and you can also do that with this other unit as well this changes when you get to some abilities uh, that are used by units are once per phase for the army, once per turn for the army, or once per battle for the army. So this means if I have the same unit twice, a good example would be the Help It Abomination. That has the, uh, an ability that is used once per turn per army. So that means that I can use it once per turn, but I can only use it uh, on one Help It and I can't do it on the other Help It. So that just limits how many times you can use all of these different abilities. Uh, contradictory rules. If two or more rules contradict, uh, if one of those rules states that something cannot do something, this takes precedent over rules that says it can or must do that thing, unless the second rule specifically overrides the restriction of the first. For example, while the normal move ability states you cannot move into combat range of an enemy unit, the fly ability specifies to ignore the combat ranges of enemy models during a move. So the second ability says uh, you can do something, don't worry about it. And that's basically how Age of Sigmar, 40k, and many games where games work they work on an exemption basis normally you can't do something but this rule says you can do something and breaks a rule okay accepting the above the effect of the most recently used ability takes precedence so this is going to be quite important when we talk about order of effects the effects of passive abilities are considered to be applied more recently than the effects of other abilities and rules now please try not to like zone out on this i've made a picture and we'll cover this the effects of the active player's passive abilities are considered to be applied more recently than the effects of their opponent's passive abilities. So here's a little graph for you, or well, image for you over time. As you can see, the active player's abilities at the bottom, active player's passive abilities, happen like last or most recently in time. Most recently or like last, effectively. Does that make sense? Your opponent's passive abilities happen uh, before that. And then at the top, you have neutral passive abilities. An example is getting cover from a piece of terrain. If there are mul multiple neutral passive abilities, the active player, that means the person whose turn it is, is going to get to choose the order in which the neutral passive abilities happen. Okay? Does that make sense? So the most recent is going to be the active player's passive abilities. This basically gives an advantage to the active player because they're going to take precedence in the stack now we're going to make a much more complex video about this in the future and we'll try to do some examples and as we go through the faction packs when they're all released we're going to deep dive this please i know this seems like a little intense but it'll be really okay and on the tabletop it'll make loads of sense it really is only going to come up in some fringe cases and they're really right in language here to cover things that need descriptions versus this is something you need to invest loads of time into thinking about i've been asked a question as i'm recording this so i'm going to reiterate this the reason uh the question was accepting the above the effect of the most recently used ability takes precedent what is this about what this means is is because there's a time on when abilities are activated it means that the one at the bottom the active player's passive abilities will take precedence over the opponent's passive abilities so this means that you'll get um, that you get to apply your like bonuses last and therefore your bonuses will override those ones. Does that make sense? Uh, and that is why that's important. Okay, so everything's an ability. Cool. What's next? We need to talk about eyeballs or more importantly, visibility. Okay, how do things see things? So actually what you do is you measure from the eyeballs of the mint now, so I'm joking. <laughs> what you do is you have models on bases and you move the bases around by measuring on the bases. But the way you see models is you measure from any physical part of the model, including the base, to any other physical part of another model. 
unless there's something that completely blocks it. So imagine just a massive wall and there's a miniature behind it. Obviously, your model can't see that model. Simple. Okay, now if there's a break in the wall, like you can see here in this ex example, you can see that model with your model. If you can, through the air, use your tape measure to draw what we call line of sight. Super easy. Now, if you can see one model that's part of a unit, you consider to be able to see all of the unit. However, your models see on a model by model basis. So say I have five models with guns, okay? And only three of them can actually see the other model. I consider to being able to see all of the units or the whole unit, but only three of my models can shoot because it's a model by model basis. So it's model by model, but once you can see one model in a unit, you see an entire unit. It's that simple. And you don't even need eyeballs. Some models don't even have eyeballs. So thankfully, this is a non-eyeball edition. So now we know who we can see, we're gonna talk about combat ranges because they're slightly different. All models obviously can move a distance uh, and then they themselves have a thing called a combat range. So effective range around them where you can't move past, which we'll talk about in a bit, uh, but also when you're within that range, you're in combat. So. Each model has a combat range that extends three inches horizontally from its base and any distance vertically from that circle to form a cylinder. So just picture a base and it goes infinitely up and three inches outside of itself. Really easy. And there's a picture you can see. I'll try and put a picture up. There's three inches from outside of itself. Okay, really easy. Okay, the combat range of a unit extends three inches horizontally and any distance vertically from every model in that unit. Units from opposing armies that are within each other's combat range and that are visible to each other are in combat. So that's important with each other. When a unit that is not in combat enters the combat range of a visible enemy unit, it moves into combat. So Age of Sigmar is a game of obviously doing spells and other stuff, but moving units into combat and fighting. The way you do this is you use the charge ability. So after the movement phase, there's a shooting phase, and then there's the charge phase where you'll do charge abilities. And that's the only way normally, except obviously murder lust, oh, bloody hell, um, to be able to move into combat range with your opponent, okay? And that's how you end up in combat. Does that make sense? So an example on the right-hand side, you can see here just above my head, that shows you that there are two units within three inches of each other, but one of those units can't be seen and therefore isn't in combat, right? And cannot be in the combat range. Another example on this left-hand side, you can see here, this shows you the combat kind of aura or combat range of a unit of liberators. And then on the right hand side, it shows you that there is a there is two different units that are in combat or within the combat range of um, the unit of liberators in the middle. And that's how combat ranges work. It's super simple. It's basically a three inch barrier that you can only get inside of using charges or other abilities. Easy to understand. But they're gonna to refer to that loads through the rules. So combat range, three inches. Just remember that. Three inches from the edge and infinitely up. Okay, so the next thing we're going to talk about is setting up your, you know, your battle, your uh, your map, your board, and how that's going to work. And we're going to talk about terrain rules in a bit and deploying terrain after this. Uh, we're also going to talk about deploying your army. But the first thing you need to do is you need to understand the maps that, that you're looking at. And all maps are battle plans. And there are some battle plans in the core rulebook, but battle plans will normally be in the General's Handbook, which is the card deck you get in the core book. And there are 12 of those. Here is an example that I'm showing you now. This is Star Strike. Uh, and then they also come uh, in these decks with also a map of terrain and where that terrain will exist on the board. If you look, this terrain is symmetrical. So no matter which side of the board you choose, you'll have the same experience as your opponent. This, in my personal opinion, is the best way to do terrain. Some people don't agree, uh, but this is good. And it means that all of the missions also have maps, which is super fun. Okay, so that is how you will immediately set up your board. You'll be like, oh, no, as long as you're following this, you don't have to do whatever you like. Right. But you have the mission and they're, they're broken up into a couple of different sections. We'll talk about this. First up, we're going to talk about the territories. As you can see, there's a defender's territory. There's an attacker's territory. And there's also this gray area in the middle. And that is the neutral territory, the neutral zone uh, <laughs> for all my DS9 fans. <laughs> anyway, so that's the neutral zone. And you can see the two little gold tokens uh, that are in the middle. Those are objective markers. 
and that's what they are. So let's talk about how it works. The first thing you would do if you were getting to the table is you would set up the objectives. Then you would set up the terrain, and then you would determine the territories. And the way you determine the territories is you would roll a dice. Okay, me and you would roll a dice. If I won the dice roll, I would choose which territory I would want to pick. Then you, as the loser of the dice roll, would get to choose who starts to deploy their army first. Now, this is actually a massive advantage, and a lot of the players who play a lot will be really interested in this because you really want to lose the roll because if you, you're you normally wanting to have less uh, drops in your opponent because you want the choice to go first. You might want to make them go first. You might want to make yourself go first, depending on your army type, depending on who you're playing against, and depending on the mission. So losing that roll is going to be quite important. But headline... Pick objectives, uh, set up objectives, set up terrain, determine territories through a dice roll, and then you will find out who gets the choice, and then you start deploying your armies. We'll talk about deploying your armies in a minute. So objectives, what the hell are objectives, Rob? Okay, we're going to talk about this in a moment and talk about how you win the game. But objectives in each mission, as you can see here, are two different markers that you put on the board. They're 40 mil markers, and then the size of the objective zone is three inches out from your 40 mil token you are able to stand on the tokens and therefore you might want to buy some objective markers like the ones you can get on the honestwargamer.com if you want uh, but they are little objectives and you, what you're going to do we talked about the control stat on miniatures earlier you're going to want to put models onto objectives to be able to control them and to score points super simple so you can stand on those and all of the maps, all of the missions are going to have different objective placements and they're going to have different places where those objectives are. Really easy. Territories. Unless otherwise specified in the battle plaque or battle plan, after terrain has been set up, the player should roll off. The winner decides which territory belongs to which player and the opponent decides which player to begins deployment. So we talked about that already. A unit is within a territory if any part of the base of any model in a unit is within that territory. A unit is wholly within a territory if every part of the base of every model in the unit is within the territory and the area of the battlefield in the middle is neutral. This is going to be important specifically because some battle tactics, which we'll talk about in a minute, are going to determine are going to specify you need to be wholly within a table quarter or wholly within this part of a territory. It's going to be important for doing faction terrain and other stuff. So super simple, nice and easy. Okay, so now we know what our board looks like and we have our army because we've already watched the how to build an army list video that I've linked below. So now we need to deploy our units and our army on the tabletop. Let's talk about that. For, this is the deployment phase, which is a single special phase, which happens before you start the five turns that you play for Age of Sigma. It's broken down into three different sections. Deploy faction terrain features, deploy armies, and use deployment phase abilities. Let's talk about the first one, which is deploy faction terrain features. This is an ability that's written down here. And what you do is you pick a friendly faction terrain feature that has not been deployed to be the target. So some armies, like Lumineth Realm Lords or Gloomspite Gits, have a faction terrain feature. Some uh, armies, like Cities of Sigma, weirdly don't have a city to deploy. And so you wouldn't do those. But you would deploy your faction terrain feature. You And this is the way you do it. You set up the target faction tree feature wholly within friendly territory. And again, just to be clear, friendly territory would be whichever of the two. So if... In the example you can see on the screen, attacker's territory and defender's territory, whichever one of the two that you are, if you're the defender, you have to set it up inside the blue zone, which is your territory. So uh, within your territory, more than three inches from all objectives, which are those little markers that I said, and any other terrain features, which will be one of the, the ones that are on the map, after you have done so, it's been deployed. Super simple. That's how you put terrain features down. One of the little bonuses about this is you can kind of sneak it into the corner if you really want it to, because it doesn't say it needs to be outside of the board edge, which is quite interesting. You can use it to create these impassable zones for large models. Quite fun. Okay, so we put down our faction terrain feature. Next, we need to put down deploying our armies. So interestingly, if you've watched the video on how to build an army, which you should have done by now, uh, you will know how to put units into regiments. But units in the game are put into regiments. And then there's also another type of unit called an auxiliary, which isn't in a regiment. So what you can do is you can deploy all of the units in a regiment at once, or you can deploy units individually 
But once you start to deploy units individually, you can't deploy an entire regiment on its own. So let's talk about it. How would I deploy a regiment? So I have a unit, which is a regiment, which is led by a hero and it's got units inside of it. I pick a regiment from your roster. You can have up to five and no units in that regiment can have already been deployed. So I can't have deployed any units from it. Keep using deploy abilities without alternating until all units that regiment are deployed. You cannot pick units that are not in that regiment as the target of those deploy abilities. Okay, so I pick my regiment, all the units in it, I'm like deploy, 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 deploy. I finish deploying that regiment. That is now me taking my first drop. That's what that would be called. So me and my opponent, let's say he's got four regiments, I've got three regiments. I would deploy all the units from one regiment, drop them down. I'd be like, I've done a drop. And then my opponent would deploy all the units from their regiment if they wanted to. They can deploy the units individually. But if they decide I'm going to deploy them individually, that would be one drop. So I would do a drop, they would do a drop. And that's how you deploy your armies. You deploy them alternating, but you can deploy an entire regiment of units as a single drop. I hope that makes sense. Nice and simple. Whoever finishes deploying their army first gets the choice on who goes first. And therefore, you normally want as few drops as possible. So normally you won't see units that are just deployed on their own. Now let's talk about deploying those units specifically because they're quite important. When you do when you do deploy a unit, whether it's part of a regiment or not, you set up the target unit wholly within friendly territory and more than nine inches from enemy territory. And after you did so, it's been deployed. Now, this is going to be interesting for different missions. So as an example, the mission that we're looking at here, Star Strike, you'll see that the territories go all the way to the midline. That means when you deploy nine inches away from your opponent's territory, you're going to be much deeper than you would be if you were playing uh, the mission Shifting Objectives because there's a larger gap between your opponent's territory and your territory in this situation. So in this one, you would have to deploy wholly within your territory. However, on shifting objectives, however, on Star Strike, you would be nine inches away from your opponent's territory, but still within your own territory, obviously. So that's how you deploy your army. You set up the battlefield and you've deployed an army. The next thing we're going to talk about is how you win a game. Okay. How do you win a game of Age of Sigmar? So a game of Age of Sigmar is less of a battle and it's more of a game. You don't, ki you don't win the game by killing enemy units, but that obviously is really effective pathway to victory because what you're doing in that situation is you're reducing your opponent's ability to score points because the way that you win games of Age of Sigmar is you score points. That's the key element. You can have all of your army killed, but as long as you score more points than your opponent, you're going to win the game. Okay, Rob, how do I score points? Cool. There are two methods for scoring points. One is controlling objectives, and the second one is battle tactics. Let's talk about controlling objectives. And we're going to look at this mission, Battle for the Pass, that you can see here. If you look on the uh, little map, you can see there are four different objective points. When you have a war scroll, like we saw with Chaos Knights earlier, they have a control score. At the end of each turn, you will, control, you will count up the control value or the control score, sorry, for each unit that's trying to hold an objective. So if we look at the objective at the top, I've got a unit of 10 Chaos Knights and you've got a unit of one dude who's only got a control value of one. I'll have a control score of 10 and you'll have a control score of one. That means I control the objective at the end of the turn. If it's the end of my turn, then I will be able to score for holding that objective. You don't score for holding objectives in your opponent's turn but you can stop them from scoring which is kind of the point so what you want to do is put as many bodies or stand on circles is what age sigma people call it you want to stand on as many circles as you can and your opponent stand on as few circles as you can now interestingly in age sigma 4 they've capped how you score in like in holding objectives to a maximum of six per turn you can see this at the top here scores are capped to a maximum of six and this might change on different missions or different battles plans but in this particular one we're looking at is maxed at six and it shows you on the right hand side at the end of each player turn uh you score one victory point if you control the objective holding within friendly territory uh you can see this down here whichever is friendly two victory points for each objective on the borders and five victory points if you control the objective holding within enemy territory so it means that it's only worth holding the opponent's uh, objective and also another one otherwise you're just scoring uh, you're scoring too many points and you're what's called capped out so there's only six so only six for holding objectives that's how you score those points but you do that each one of your player turns so getting those six points each player turn is going to be really important 
The other way to, the other way to score points are battle tactics. Some people call these battle chores. That's what I call them, battle chores. Uh, and at the start of each of your player turns, you've got to use the tactical gambit ability. And it says it here, once per battle round at the start of your turn. So you only do it the one time, unless you're playing Kairos. Uh, so you do this and you choose a battle tactic. You can't choose a battle tactic that you've previously attempted to do. And therefore, you have to, uh, you know, kind of guess like which ones you're going to try and do in the future. And these will have some stipulations on what you need to do. It's like a mission. And if you complete that mission at the end of your turn, you are going to score four victory points. So battle tactics are almost as valuable as always holding most of the objectives on the board. And you're going to try and do both of those two things in your turn. You can try and hold objectives, and you can try and score battle tactics. An example of a battle tactic is do not waver. You complete this battle tactic at the end of your turn if two or more friendly units fought this turn and no friendly units were destroyed this turn. So you have to make sure you follow the stipulation or the chore that it's giving you, and then you'll score four victory points. So stand on circles, complete battle tactics. You'll be able to do five across the course of the game, and that is how you score points. And the person with the most points at the end will win. One last thing, though, to say about picking battle tactics and the tactical gambit is that in some cases, you aren't going to be able to pick one. In, uh, Age of Sigmar is broken up into battle rounds. There are five that you'll play over the course of the game, and they're broken into two player turns, my turn and your turn, as an example. However, at the end of each battle round, we'll roll some dice. This is called the priority roll. And whoever rolls higher will get to choose who goes first in the next turn. If our role is equal, then whoever went first then uh, wins, basically. Whoever went first in the last turn or whoever went last in the last turn doesn't win. That's the way it works. Okay, so then you get to choose who goes first in the next turn. Now, if you went last in the previous turn and you won the role and therefore can go again and choose to go again, this is what we would call the double turn. If you ever decide to take a double turn, you are not allowed to choose a battle tactic. So you're going to give up the ability to score four points. However, as I talked about before, you might be in a really advantageous position to kill a load of the enemy units, stop them scoring or doing some other stuff so that you reduce their resources so they're not going to be able to score points or stand on circles. That's how that works. So the double turn, though, is probably going to be a, loss, a lot less effective in Age of Sigmar 4, uh, but we'll see. We haven't actually seen how the game works. But in some cases, you aren't going to be able to do a battle tactic if you choose to get the double. You greedy, greedy person. Okay, so we've deployed. We know how to pick our armies. We know what abilities are, so we're going to get into the turn sequence. Okay, so we've deployed all our armies. We're ready to rock. So Age of Sigmar, as I've said, is five uh, battle rounds, each broken up into two turns, and in between each battle round is a priority role that you do. Okay, and the priority role is the start of a battle round, that's what it's called, and you determine the active player through a dice roll. I've described that already. The next thing that you do is you determine the underdog. So after the first battle round, whichever player has the fewest victory points is the underdog for the battle round. If players are tied, e.g. the first battle round, there is no underdog uh, unless otherwise specified. This is quite important because the underdog is normally going to get bonuses. Things like extra command points is what you're going to get. Start battle round abilities. The active player can use any start of battle round abilities first, then their opponent does the same. Okay, now we're going to talk about turn phases. And the turn is the, the a turn is broken into the start of the turn, the hero phase, the movement phase, the shooting phase, the charge phase, the combat phase, and at the end of the turn. Now, Games Workshop, in their infinite wisdom, decided that they were going to say that there were no phases in the phases or no sub phases. But this is just untrue. There are many sub phases to go through. And as we've talked about with the abilities, where there are stacks or ability stacks, there are also additional different ability stacks. So each of these phases also has additional sub phases but when do you do your abilities and when do your opponent do your abilities that's what they cover here okay once the active player has finished using any of their abilities in a phase so pick the hero phase i have a bunch of abilities i can do in the hero phase as the active player i would do all of my hero phase act like active player hero phase abilities then my opponent would do any of their hero phase abilities after as the non-active player so it just goes on to describe that once the active player has finished using abilities, their opponent can then use any abilities with enemy phase or any phase timing in the order of their choosing. So I do everything in the order that I want to do when, in, when as the active player, and then my opponent does uh, the things in that phase as well. Okay, and any phase does almost always mean every phase. Uh, okay. 
Now, this is different, and that's going to apply to most of the phases apart from the fight phase. The fight phase is different. This is when you're like having an actual sword fight, and this is different. Okay, abilities with a fight keyword, so fighting is a keyword, follow a different sequence to other abilities. When the player are using combat phase abilities as described in 13.0, they cannot use fight abilities. So normally I do all of my abilities, right? So here are phase I do all my abilities. When I get to the combat phase, I can do all of my abilities apart from the fight ability. Okay, after players are finished using combat phase abilities that are not fight abilities, they must alternate picking one eligible unit to fight um, using a fight ability starting with the active player. Each unit in the combat must use a fight ability if able to do so. So you must fight. Okay, so I'm in combat, I must fight. Once a player has no more units that are eligible to fight, the other player continues to pick units that are eligible to fight one after another until there are no more eligible units to fight. Okay, so I've broken this down into a little sketch for everybody. Okay, so you're the active player. It's your non-fight combat phase abilities. Okay, so then your opponent's non-fight combat phase abilities. So that's what we do. We do all of our abilities with the exception of fighting. So I do any special bonuses, then you do all of your special bonuses. Cool. Now we've passed that two steps, which is how it works in all other phases. Now we get into the fighting steps. Okay, and then we alternate units. Now there is another thing that you can get in Age of Sigmar where units can be always strikes first, and, or strike first, sorry, and then they can strike last. So the fight step is broken into three different phases. You've got the striking first units, you've got the normal units, and you've got the striking last units. And you would alternate at each one of those steps, starting with the active player. So we get into, we've got a bunch of units that have strike first. As the active player, I choose the first one, then my opponent goes, and then we keep going until all the strike first units are done. Sweet. Then we move into the normal step. And then as the active player, I would choose the first unit, and then we keep going with my opponent. We alternate. I do a combat, they do a combat, I do a combat. Perfect. And then next, we do strike last. And again, as the active player, I start doing all of the strike last ones, and then they start doing their strike last ones, and then we alternate until all units are brought into combat. It does go on to say uh, in this article here that if a unit is given both strike last and strike first, then neither of those effects apply and they fight at the normal step. OK, another very technical part, OK, is there might be situations where a unit has a strike, f a strike first, is not in combat at the start of the phase, but because of moves such as piling moves, it's pulled into combat later. In such cases, strike first has no effect on that unit. What that means is it can't like immediately go before another unit and instead it just falls into whichever sub stack it's in and then just fights alternating. In addition, if a unit is dragged into combat that's got like um, always strikes last, it's still going to be able to or like you know you're at the always strike last step and they fight at the normal step when you drag them into combat they're still going to be able to fight just in the normal step that they're at they're not going to get to jump ahead of the queue or anything like that okay so once you're in a step you're fighting in that step and you must fight lastly because there were lots of these abilities in age of sigma 3 abilities that allow a unit to use a fight ability immediately after another unit do not override the strike first or strike last constraints so you could pick a unit with strike last to fight immediately after so you could not sorry pick a unit with strike last to fight immediately after with strike first so you cannot kind of like push someone up the stack with abilities that's what it's saying it's like if you strike last that's where you sit in the stack you just live there that's where you've got to live okay Super simple, I guess. <laughs> really easy. Uh, so <laughs> again, uh, just a quick recap, because I think it'd be really good to do that. A game is made of five battle rounds. Battle round is broken up into two turns. You roll for priority in between each battle round. The winner gets to choose who goes first in the next battle round. Um, if you do and if you do end up uh, choosing to have a double turn, you can't choose a battle tactic. In addition to that, you then work out who is the underdog, who's on the least amount of points. Super simple. And then every single turn in the game works with the active player. So whoever's taking the turn does all of their abilities in that phase first, then their opponent does theirs. Apart from the combat phase, where fight abilities are just used after in that order. Nice and easy. Okay, so. Let's talk about the phase, the abilities, sorry, that you're going to be able to do. And these are all core abilities, which makes up the kind of like uh, the structure and the skeleton of how a game works. OK, you've got normal move, run, retreat, shoot, 
uh, charge and fight. And this basically makes up the core mechanics of how you play a game. You'll move your, you'll move your units around. Uh, you might run some. You might retreat some. Uh, you'll shoot with your shoot your weapons. You'll charge units into combat, into that uh, combat range we talked about. And then you'll do fighting in the combat phase. So let's talk about them in detail. Okay, so in your movement phase, you'll do a normal move. You'll measure from the base of your mini. Uh, and you'll move up to the movement value, which we saw on the war scroll. Pick a friendly unit that's not in combat, so they can't be in combat. To use his ability, that unit can move a distance up to its move characteristic. The unit cannot move into combat during that part of the move, so it can't move into combat. Also can't move into the combat range of enemy units, as we've talked about, unless it's got the fly keyword, in which case it can pass through it. So you can't pass through the combat range of an enemy unit. Next up, we've got run. Pick a friendly unit that is not in combat to use this ability. Make a run roll of D6. That unit can move a distance up to its move characteristic plus the run roll. The unit cannot move into combat during any part of the move. Again, this is a core ability. And because they're both core abilities done in the movement phase, you can't do both. Can't do a normal phase, uh, can't do a normal move, and then a run. You do one or the other. Lastly, retreat. So, you pick a friendly unit that is in combat to use this ability. You inflict D3 mortal damage. So, you pick one of your units that's in combat. You inflict D3 mortal damage. We haven't really talked about that yet, but that's damage that you'll do that will take health off your units. That unit can move a distance up to its move characteristic. This, that unit can move through the combat ranges of enemy units, but cannot end that move within an enemy unit's combat range. So, effectively, this allows you to retreat out of dodge, get out of a fight you don't want to be a part of, but you are going to take mortal damage for doing so. Okay, nice and easy. Shooting is kind of self-explanatory, but you pick a friendly unit that has not used a run or retreat ability this turn, and that's quite important. You can't use run or retreat and shoot. You also can't use run and retreat and charge. Okay, uh, and then this, uh, then pick one or more enemy units as the target if this unit attacks. Resolve the shooting attacks against the target unit. We're going to talk about how to resolve attacks in a moment. Uh, now we're going into the charge phase, and you can use the charge ability. This is quite interesting, the way this works. You pick a friendly unit that's not in combat, that has not used a run or retreat ability this turn to use its ability. Then you make a charge roll. That unit can move a distance up to the value of the charge roll. That unit can move through the combat ranges of any enemy units and must end that move within half an inch of a visible enemy unit. If it does so, that unit using the ability has charged. Okay? Very, very easy. It's 2d6. Importantly, you don't need to choose a target. So other game systems, you need to choose a target. You don't need to be within a certain range. So be like you don't need to be within 12 inches or anything like that. I just pick a unit. As long as it hasn't run or retreated, roll 2d6 and then move it that far. If it gets within half an inch, obviously you would pre-measure. Don't move it and then be like, I'm not half within half an inch. Then move it back. You would just move it. Okay? Super simple. And then finally, combat phase, which is what we talked about earlier, uh, the fight phase. You can use the fight core ability. Pick a friendly unit that is in combat or that charge this turn to use this ability. That unit can make a pile-in move. Now, that's quite an important distinction because if I'm already in combat, I can fight, fine. And if I charged and I'm in combat, I can fight, that's great. But what if two units charged in and the first unit wiped out a unit. Well, the second unit is still gonna be able to make a piling move. So you can still move three inches. We'll talk about piling moves in a bit. So that's an important distinction. So if you charged, uh, and then if you're in combat, you can fight. If you charged, if you charge, you can fight. And then if you charged, you can still always make a three inch piling. The unit does not need to be visible in order for you to be able to charge it. It just must be within it must be visible when you end your charge, okay? Uh, and then if that unit is in combat, you must pick one or more of the enemy units tar to target with this unit's attacks. And then the resolving of that is you resolve the combat attacks against the target unit. Uh, something someone has asked, which I think is a great point, is all War Scrolls will have access to the core abilities. You'll always be able to move. You'll always be able to do a retreat. Like, as long as the prequisites, you know, like you're in combat, you could do a retreat. You're not in combat, you can do a move. You're in combat, you can do a fight. All War Scrolls will have access to those core abilities, and that's why they're core. Um, whereas your more unique war uh, more unique abilities, for instance, command abilities, which we'll talk about in a bit, or abilities that you find in War Scrolls, are located on the War Scroll. So that's the distinction between both. Okay, so in our example, we're going to skip kind of past the hero phase where we'll do spells 
and where we'll do uh, where we'll do uh, prayers and other stuff. We're going straight into the movement phase, and we'll cover the spells and everything else in much more detail in a moment. So first up, we want to move our models. So in the movement phase, which is the second phase that we do, movement value is located on the war scroll. If it says it can move ten inches, then you can move every model in that unit ten inches, but no greater than ten inches. And you've got to account for pivots on a model and how a base would move. The important part uh, to talk about is that models, when they move, especially groups of models, like big monsters are fine. And you've got to remember, if you move the back of a large base, you've got to account for how much that was going to take up into its movement as well. That's an important thing to remember. But when you're moving a group of models, they have to stay in coherency. So coherency is kind of like a, a grouping of those models to show that they're part of a group. And coherency is where every model in that group has to be within half an inch horizontally of um, another model in that group. Super simple, half an inch. So they all move quite close together, unless that unit size of that model is seven or more. So if there is more than seven models in that unit, then you need to be within coherency of two other models. So if the unit is six models or less, you just need to be within half an inch of another model from that unit. But if it's seven or more, you need to be within half an inch of two other models in that unit. If you try to do a move where your unit would end up out of coherency, then that unit cannot make that move. When you're moving oh, like uh, on top of terrain, you must be able to land on top of terrain so that, um, and we'll get to terrain in a bit because it's a bit more complex, but basically you gotta make sure your models are flat. And obviously you can't move your models on their side or on top of their head or anything dumb like that, don't be a dummy. Uh, but they just move that amount, okay? And you gotta keep those units in coherency, nice and simple. Okay, we're going to talk about moving across terrain uh, and moving up and down terrain in the core rules. Okay, so moving across terrain, if it's less than an inch, don't even worry about it. Don't even think it exists. That's fine. You could just move across it. Okay, but if you are moving up and down terrain, then if you're moving, up, like if it's larger than an inch, let's say it's a big wall or, or a hill, uh, then you would measure how much the vertical distance you need to go, and then you would take that off your movement. So let's say you can move 10 inches, and the wall that you want to move up is four inches, then you're only going to have another six inches when you get to the top of that wall. Don't forget, you've got to place your model flat when you do get to the top. So some things, for instance, like uh, a forest, you're not going to, like, it's going to seem a bit silly to place a model on top of it. And in fact, most terrain uh, maps and most tournaments organizers are going to say you can't put models on top of piece of terrain because it does become a bit silly to be honest however if you do end up on a piece of uh, top of a piece of terrain then you've got access to be able to do jumping down where jumping down is you measure from the top uh, from the from the model down to the bottom of where it wants to move whether it's a lower level or the ground and then you would account for its movement value and then again it can only move that far however unlike climbing up where you can climb up and continue moving if you do jump down you can no longer continue moving uh, and therefore you immediately stop so that's what jumping down does if you're not if you don't have the movement value to jump down as in it's too far to the ground, you won't be able to go down uh, and therefore won't be able to jump down. And that's how that works. But in my opinion, most terrain, you should just pretend that you can't ever stand on it or go near it because of scary magic and just move around it. That's probably the most healthy way to play Age of Sigmar and that's how I've always played it. Just a quick bit of clarification. Um, if you, do, if you, uh, you can um, even... Sorry about being garbled there. A unit can actually jump down any distance okay but then it's move immediately stops what it's saying in the rule is that if you do jump down uh then or you attempt to jump down but there's something like in the way let's say a model uh then you won't be able to make the move but you can jump down any distance i apologize okay so next type of move we're going to talk about is a piling move. So pylons are quite important and they're done when you have completed a charge or if you're in combat. Okay, if your unit is in combat, you pick an enemy unit that's in combat with to be the target. This is important because sometimes your unit can end up in combat with more than one unit. You could end up in combat with two different units. Therefore, you pick a target unit and all models in your unit can move up to three inches towards the target unit. However, you cannot 
go away from any other units that you're in combat with, or you have to stay within combat of them. So you have to stay within three. Okay, so that's important. Uh, and that's it. You just move three inches. Each model within three, you have moved three inches. You've obviously got to maintain coherency when you do the three inch move. And the reason you would do a pile in move, I guess, because people might not know that, is so that you can get more attacks because you have three inch range on all of your combats. So therefore, you want to bring as many models into range to be able to fight as possible. So you want to move towards uh, 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 the target unit. So that's important. You choose a target unit. If you're just in range with one unit, that's easy and it's not a problem. Just move everything in range of it, okay? If your unit is not in combat, each model in your unit can move three inches in any direction. That move can pass through and end within combat ranges of enemy units. Now, don't forget, the only reason you can do a piling move is because you've done a charge move that turn. And the only reason it's giving you this example it doesn't mean uh, all your units can also make piling moves. It means only if you've done a charge move, you can do a piling move. But how could I have done a charge move and not be in combat with a unit? The reason is, is because you've charged in with two units and the first unit has wiped out, done a piling, wiped out that first unit, and then your second unit is going to make a piling and move. Okay? Super easy. Now, when you're moving, there's also a keyword that, again, those keywords will be at the bottom of the war scroll, like we talked about earlier. And some of the units that you find in Sigma are going to have the fly keyword. And if they do have the fly keyword, then the effect is that as this unit moves, it ignores other models, terrain features, and combat ranges of enemy units. It cannot end its move in combat or you know, within the combat range of enemy unit unless specified in the ability that allows it to move. Ignore any vertical distance moved for this unit so it can ignore all vertical distances so effectively what this means is if you you know charge him with a flying unit or move in the flying unit as long as you aren't in combat with an enemy unit at the end of it you can pop around the board in addition when fly moving flying units move them horizontally in any direction ignoring intervening models and terrain and place them where you wish so long as they're allowed to end there a lot of terrain states that you cannot end up on a piece of terrain. You cannot move on top of a piece of terrain. So basically you can fly over terrain, fly over units, okay? Note that some units have the fly keyword, even if that unit can't really fly, you know, in the story, this often represents a bouncing or something like that. Super easy, very fun. So now we know how to move, we need to attack. And we've got two different types of attack, really. You've got attacks in the shooting phase, which unsurprisingly is shooting attacks. Uh, and then of course, you've got uh, attacks that you'll do in the combat phase, but they all use the same process. So we can learn this as one phase, okay? First thing you need to do is you need to pick a target. You need to pick targets for all attacks when declaring an attacking ability. So you need to pick all the targets for all of your weapons that you have on your war scroll. Let's just quickly remind ourselves of what weapons look like on a war scroll. As you can see here, looking at the Spirit of Durthu, this top uh, weapon, the Verdant Blast, is a ranged weapon. So you'll do this in the shooting phase. And then the melee weapons, the Guardian Sword and the Massive Impaling Talons, you'll do and use in the combat phase. You won't be able to use the ranged weapon Verdant Blast in the shooting, uh, sorry, in the combat phase because it's a shooting weapon. And unless it has a special ability on it that says shoot into combat, because some weapons will say that, some abilities will say that. So that's super simple. You pick targets for all attacks when declaring attack ability. If a unit is in combat, it can only attack with its combat weapons uh, and that are visible to it. That's important. Don't forget you've got to be visible. And if making a combat attack with the target must be within the attacking model's combat range. So if I would like to make a melee attack or a combat attack in combat, I need my model to be within three inches. And it's possible uh, of the enemy unit that I'm targeting. It's possible that I could have like a long string of units and only four or five of my 10 models are within three inches to strike at a unit. Then all four, of, uh, like four or five of those models will be able to strike, but the rest won't be able to. It's also possible that my big strung out unit will be in combat with two different units, and they might be able to split those attacks up between those two different units. That's also something that you can do. Uh, when you're making a shooting attack, the target must be visible and within the weapon's range. So as an example, when we're looking at Durthu, I need the enemy unit to be within 12 inches and visible to be able to make the shooting attack. So the shooting attack, I need to be visible and within range and combat attack, I need to be within, I also need to be visible and each model needs to be within three inches to make those attacks. Super simple. You can also split attacks. So if you do have more than one attack, 
on your profile, you will be able to split those attacks. So again, if we go and look at Durthu, and we look at Durthu being in combat with two different units, he could make it so that he does two attacks with his Guardian Sword against one unit, and two attacks with his Guardian Sword against another unit. Another question that's been raised is, can I shoot at a enemy unit that's in combat with one of my friendly units? And the answer is yes. You absolutely can. That is how you are, that is what you can do. You just cannot shoot with your shooting unit if it is in combat, unless it has, like these rat ogres here, the shooting combat ability. So shooting is gonna be within range, obviously visible to the target, but if it's in combat, you can still shoot with them. Okay, so let's talk about applying uh, the attacks and how it works, okay? So I've got a unit in combat or a shooting unit, whichever, and I need to be able to resolve all of my attacks. So let's talk about it. The first thing I need to do is I need to remember that I assign all of my attacks before I start rolling any dice. So I, I, I'm just in combat or I'm just shooting at one unit, nice and simple. I assign where all of my attacks are going and they're all going into that one unit then I start rolling my dice. It gets a little bit more complicated if you're in combat with two or more units. If I'm in combat with two units or I'm shooting at two units, as an example, what I'll do is I'll assign all of my dice. I'm gonna roll this many dice at that unit and this many dice at that unit. And then I resolve all of the results of one uh, unit that I'm targeting and all of my attacks for that unit. And then I move on to the next one. And I get to do it in the order of my choice as the attacking uh, dude. And then I roll to hit, I roll to wound, they make save rolls and then we determine the damage. And that is how you go through an entire attack sequence. So how does this work? Super simple, let's go look at a war scroll to give us an example. If we're gonna do combat, and we are gonna do combat, we're gonna use the massive impaling talons on a spirit of Durthu. He has two attacks and therefore I'll roll two dice. I'll roll to hit and it's a four plus. That means any results of four, five or six means I have hit. I wound on a two, that means any result other than a one means I'm gonna wound, and then I am rend two. So as I said earlier in the video, rend reduces the save of the enemy unit. So Spirit of Durthu has got a three up armor save. So if a Durthu was attacking another Durthu, then I would take two away from that save, so it would go from a three to a five. So three, four, five, take them off and you go up, okay? And then it does three damage. So if I hit with both, wounded with both, and the my opponent didn't make any save, then I would have two lots of three, and that would be six damage, which I would assign to the health of the enemy unit. If I took over, if I if the six health went over the damage, uh, the health characteristic of one model in that unit, one model would be slain. That w the rest of the damage would then carry over onto the next model, and it would keep going until another model was slain. Now, some abilities or some units in the game have special weapon abilities, and we're going to talk about those more in a bit. And those are um, those are located on the right hand side of your war scroll, and they are normally any sixes to hit. For instance, critical mortal. Any sixes to hit means the damage value is going to do mortal damage. So. A six to hit is going to do mortal damage. We'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, but critical mortals, critical abilities are going to happen on those. And anti-abilities are going to be if you target specific units. Okay, let's talk about modifiers to our attack rolls, okay? So we have pluses and negatives to attack rolls. You might get plus one to hit from a special ability or that's on your war scroll or from a spell or something like that. And you might also be minus one to hit from an ability as well. These are what we call capped, but they're capped at the end of the culmination. So we'll just do the math really quickly. If I've got minus one to hit, I'm minus one to hit, super simple. If I'm plus one to hit, I'm also plus one to hit. If I'm minus one to hit, and plus one to hit, then I have got no, no bonuses or negatives to my profile. If I am plus two to hit, then I can only ever be minus one to hit because it's capped at minus one. If I'm plus two to hit, and then I'm minus one to hit, I'm still minus one to hit. If I'm minus 10 to hit, <laughs> and minus, uh, let's work this out, minus, uh, so plus eight to hit, then it's still minus one to hit. Does that make sense? So they, they, you do the math, basically. You add all the pluses, you add all the minuses, and then you work out what it is, but it can only ever be minus one or plus one. And I hope that makes sense. 
okay? The thing, the place where this... <laughs> so the only place where this plus and minus conversation is not capped is when you're dealing with your armor saves and your rend. Or actually, kind of is capped, but it kind of isn't. So rend obviously reduces your armor save. So if you have rend one, it takes your armor save down by one. But you can have really high rend, like let's say up to rend four. That means your armor save will be reduced up to the point where you maybe don't even have an armor save. So rend is never capped. You can constantly add and stack rend potentially on a weapon profile, but you can only add plus one to your armor save. But similarly, because it is capped, you can only go from a four up to a three up or a five up to a four up. But this is still the end of some math. So as an example, if I have plus one to my save, super simple, I go from a four up to a three up save. Easy peasy. If I have minus one, if I have rend one, then I'll go from a four up save to a five up save. Again, if I have both of those two things at the same time, so plus one save and rend one, I will stay at my four up save as an example. And then you just start adding numbers. If I've got plus two to my save and they've got rend one, then I would go from, I would still be, have a three up armor save. I would still have a three up armor save. because I'd be plus two, minus one. So I would still be plus one. And that's what save stacking is and how you would build up big saves. Nice and easy. So we did talk about crit mortals earlier and mortal damage. And this is gonna be quite an important uh, thing. Uh, mortal damage immediately skips you being able to have any armor save. And instead, you just immediately apply however much mortal damage you do to the health pool of the enemy unit. It becomes damage points immediately, and then you immediately apply that to the, uh, to the damage to the health, and you won't make any armor saves. The exception uh, for uh, saving mortal damage, so on your war scroll, again, if we just go and look at Durthu, you can see he's got a three up save here. If you scroll to the bottom, he doesn't have a ward save, uh, RIP Durthu. A ward save is one of the only things that you can make after um, you assign damage points. So, and this is gonna stack up with mortal damage and normal damage as well. So the way a ward save would work is if I do my attack sequence and I'm able to give three damage to my opponent, and I've done three mortal damage, I just put them together in a pool and then I'll roll them like I would with an armor save. And if I had a six up ward save, any sixes I made would negate those damage points. If it's a five up ward save, any five ups I made would negate those damage points. So though a ward save is, if you're a 40K player, it's like a feel no pain. Um, if you're new to wargaming, it's just a save you make once you've collated all of the damage pools together. Okay, so a few more things about generating dice. So, you know, if you just got like a normal profile like Dirthu, we said, you've got four attacks, fine. Yeah, he does two damage, that's fine. But sometimes things have a random amount of attacks. Sometimes they have a random amount of damage. And these are random characteristics. And obviously you can see them located on War Scrolls, all right? When using a random characteristic, you generate it each time it's needed for an ability, and then you generate it per model. So if you've got like, I don't know, D3 attacks or D6 attacks, and you've got four models in the unit, then you would roll D6 for each model in the unit to generate how many it did. If I went through the attack sequence and I got to the damage step and I you know, wounded them like seven times, and then I had D3 damage, I would roll seven dice and work out the D3 damage from each one of those. Super simple. Uh, uh, and really, really easy. Uh, okay, so that's random characteristics, and I hope that helps you. Okay, then there's a modifier order, and uh, modifiers are when you are doing something like halving uh, the total of a, a thing or reducing down the number of attacks, something like that. And modifiers are have a core rule in here where if a characteristic uses a random characteristic, oh, sorry, the effects of some abilities modify a characteristic role, unless stated otherwise, a characteristic role cannot be modified to less than one. The exception of this is rend, which can be modified to a minimum of zero. So if you, a unit's got rend one and I cast a spell on it, it makes it rend zero, that's fine. However, if I reduce the number of attacks a unit has got down by one and they started with one, then I won't be able to reduce it to zero. Instead, they've got to have like four or five attacks and I reduce it down by one. So that's how it works, okay? 
If a characteristic uses a random characteristic role, apply the characteristic modifiers after the characteristic has been generated. And this is the order in which it works. This is incredibly techy, but it's important. Modifiers that set a characteristic to a fixed value. So let's say um, you change a characteristic to 10 or 5 or something like that. Modifiers that multiply or divide a characteristic. So then after that, let's say I've set it to 10 for some reason, and I can divide it. I'll divide it, and now it's 5. Okay, modifiers that add to or subtract from a characteristic are done next. So then for some reason I'm able to add plus three, then I would add plus three. In a situation where you've got an odd number like nine and you're able to halve it, then whenever you get to a uneven or a, like a you know, half a number, then you will always round down. And that's how that works. So I know that seems a little complex and overt, but this is a nice little section to kind of like have on your phone or write down. So the modifier order, random characteristics are pretty easy. Modifier order is something that might come up in certain situations. And it's really nice to have that clearly written out. Okay, so attack sequence, modifiers, we're kind of talking about that. We're gonna talk about the damage sequence a little bit, just in a little bit more detail. So, you know, you've rolled to hit, you've rolled to wound, you made your armor saves. Then you have, once that's all done, you have a damage pool. Right, and this kind of goes into the damage sequence. It's not super complicated, but it's just written incredibly specifically, so you can just do it right. So let's say you've got an allotment of some damage, let's say 10 damage. What you do is you assign that damage to a unit. You just keep being like damage, damage, damage. When it gets to the whatever the health pool of one of the models in the unit is, let's say the model has got five health, then you would remove one of those models. You don't assign damage, which is what you used to do in Age of Sigma 3, to a unit, uh, sorry, to a model, and instead you just assign it to the unit and then you pick a model out of that unit to be a model that's slain. You cannot remove a model that would then make the unit be out of coherency. So that some, can't be something that you do. Also, after you've done the hit to wound and armor saves, as I've talked about earlier, there's the ward save section. And this is where, uh, once you've got all the damage, before you assign that damage to a unit, you would be making your ward saves. But I've covered that already, uh, I'm pretty certain. Uh, once a model is slain, it's slain, obviously. And then once a unit has had all of its models slain, that unit is destroyed. Yeah, it does say here, the commander of a unit must pick which models in the unit are slain. However, if each slain model is removed, the unit must be in single coherent group. If this is not possible, continue to remove models one at a time until the unit is in a single coherent group. So if ever there's a situation where you might have to remove a model to make it be incoherent, then all the models need to be gone until it becomes coherent again. And this is a big change for Age of Sigmar. Uh, players who've been playing a lot. And then some units are destroyed. Uh, when all models in the unit have been uh, uh, slain, then that unit is then destroyed. So you've got slain and destroyed. Okay, so we know about damage, we know about ward saves, we know about the attack sequence and everything else. And earlier on I talked about the fact that some, well, some weapons are going to have certain weapon abilities, universal weapon abilities. There's also in the game specific weapon abilities for some different units. As an example, Zinch, you've got the ability to do a burning mechanic as a weapon ability, but we'll kind of skip that for now. And we'll just go to the fact that many of the weapons you're gonna find are gonna have universal weapon abilities. And we're gonna go through them right now. First of all, we're gonna talk about is anti-X. So the X is gonna represent something like cavalry or a hero or a certain type of unit, which again, you can find those keywords at the bottom of a war scroll. You add one to this weapon's rend characteristic if the target has the keyword after anti or fulfills a condition after anti. Multiples of this ability are cumulative, and this is pretty huge. Multiples of this ability are cumulative. For example, if a weapon has both anti-charge, plus one rend, so if you are charged, your weapon will get plus one rend, and anti-hero, plus one rend, if you fight against a hero, you get plus one rend, then add two rend characteristics of the weapon for the attacks that target a hero that charge in the same turn. This is especially nice, as one of the most egregiously good units in Age of Sigmar is always a monster hero. So if you have an ability or uh, able to gain the ability that has plus one rend against a monster and a hero, that's going to stack plus one uh, rend, plus one rend. I love that. Okay, so those are the anti-X abilities. Some are going to have charge plus one damage, and this obviously makes a lot of sense. Add one to this weapon's damage characteristic if the attacking unit charged this turn. So I've got three attacks which are damage one, but I charge this turn, then this means I've got three attacks which could be damage two, as long as I obviously go through the attack sequence and they're successful. Next one is companion, and this one's a little bit more complicated. Uh, this is normally for like mounts, so like a dragon that you ride in on or something. This weapon is not affected by the abilities used by friendly unit that affect the attacks characteristics, that's how many attacks you have, or the attack sequence, which is 
plus to hit, minus to hit, plus to wound, minus to wound, you're not able to affect them. You are still going to be able to be able to strike first or strike last, an example, but you just can't change how many attacks they have, and you cannot change your sequence. This sounds like a negative initially, but it also means it's also not a bad thing, right? Uh, oh, no, hold on. I apologize. Sorry, I got confused there. It's by friendly, okay? You cannot be affected by friendly unit that has uh, that affects the attack sequence, but the enemy is still going to be able to, it's worse than I thought, the enemy is still going to be able to affect companion effects, uh, companion abilities, and therefore that's pretty bad. Okay, next up is crit two hits, and this is worded quite complicated, and I've always really struggled to explain this, but if you roll a six to hit, then that hit will become two wound rolls so you'll be able to roll two wound rolls instead of uh, just rolling one normally if i roll to hit and i succeed i'll roll that dice as a wound dice but crit two hits means i roll two wound dice we sometimes call them exploding hits uh, but that's what crit two hits means uh, crit auto wound is if an attack made with this weapon scores a critical hit which is a six to hit the attack automatically wounds the target and you make a save roll as normal so it just means you don't have to roll the wound dice and then you've got crit mortal which is if an attack made with this weapon scores a critical hit, which is a six to hit, then you inflict a number of mortal damage on the target equal to the damage characteristic of that weapon and the attack sequence ends. So this is really good because it not only skips you having to roll to wound, it skips them being able to make an armor save. So critical mortals are probably straight out the best one you can find in the game. Um, so that's what the one you normally wanted to look for. And the shooting combat is what we explained earlier, where this weapon is normally a ranged weapon, it's gonna be able to be used in combat. So you're in combat, but you can still shoot your weapon, which is nice. Uh, just to be clear, um, because we have talked about this a little bit, but companion weapons, I think those ones are going to be, oh, can I do this or can I do that? Can I not do that? You, you cannot use friendly abilities to affect how many attacks you do, and then the pluses, uh, the, the hits and the wounds and the rend, the attack sequence, basically. But you can still give them weapon abilities, like we've seen with Seraphon, where you can make them have crit two hits, and the enemy is still going to be able to debuff their profile. Uh, but you generally aren't going to be able to generally affect the number of attacks and the plus, the, the hits and the two wounds. Errata number two to that statement is we haven't talked about command abilities yet, where you can get plus one to hit like all out attack, but that one specifically states that you are gonna be able to have plus one to hit, okay? So you aren't able to use friendly abilities unless they specifically state that they do affect companion units is what I probably should have said in, like, in full. Okay, healing. Okay, maybe you're not a fighter, maybe you're a lover. Maybe you want to do some healing. There's a lot of healing in this game. Uh, healing uh, allows you to remove a number of damage points that have been assigned to a unit. So again, in our example where we've got a unit with five health on each model and we've got two damage assigned to it, heal two would allow me to remove two of those damage tokens or so two of those damage points effectively. So it's heal and then the number of brackets is the volume that you can heal. As well as healing, you can bring models back to life, returning and adding models. And there is a little stipulation along this. Some, ability, some abilities allow you to return, say, models to a unit or add new models to a unit. In either case, set of those models one at a time in coherency. And the important part is with models in that unit that were not returned or added this turn. The new models can only be set up in combat with an enemy unit if their unit is already in combat. So I can't return a model and then get myself cheekily into combat. And again, I can't return a model if it can't go into coherency with my uh, with any models that weren't set up this turn. So say I can return like 100 models. I wouldn't be able to like place them so that they weren't that they were close enough to a unit that already was on there. So that's effectively what that's covering and you can't then obviously set them into combat. Okay, so the next thing to talk about is some units are tokens. Uh, <laughs> tokens, not points or objectives or, or anything else. They're tokens. And those tokens don't really count. So like the Griff Crow is the example of a token. There are going to be many tokens. Pray for the squire in Cities of Sigmar that he's not just a token because he's a brave lad. Uh, but tokens don't exist basically they're just thematic in fact you probably don't even need to bring them along with you if you don't want to although obviously you should uh and they just move out the way if they're in the way you move them out the way they don't they're not part of the unit for coherency they don't count for measuring ranges they're just they just don't exist basically but they're there and they're cute 
The next thing we're going to talk about is units and specifically setting up units because as well as returning units, you can set up units either from reserve. When deployment, you can put units to the side because they have special deployment abilities. And you can also set up units on the board either from reserve or from teleports or from summoning or all, all sorts of things. Okay. Uh, when you summon, uh, sorry, when you set up a unit, when doing so, you must set up all models in the unit. If this is impossible, you cannot use that ability. A unit set up on the battlefield in a phase other than the deployment phase cannot use move abilities in the movement phase of the same turn. Okay, reserve units, which is units set up on the side of the board, allow you to set units in reserve. These units are placed to one side instead of being set up on the battlefield. And at the start of the fourth battle round, units that were set up in reserve using deployability uh, and that are still in reserve are destroyed. So you've got to get those guys on the board, otherwise they're going to be killed. Okay, replacement units. Some abilities allow you to set up replacement units. Quite a lot, actually, in Age of Sigmar. This is something you should really commit to, to memory. When setting up that unit, it should have the same war scroll type, weapon options, and number of models as the original unit, unless otherwise specified in the ability. Many of these abilities specify the proportion of models in the replacement unit, e.g. half the number of models from the original unit, which is what they normally say. And they normally say half the number of models in the original unit, rounding up, which is really good for our three model unit kings, uh, because obviously they become like 1.5 they become two uh, in these cases you can pick which models from the original unit are set up this is quite important because some models have special rules or weapons attached to them like the champion might have a special weapon bring the banner man back so you got better control those sorts of things the replacement unit is otherwise treated as a new unit any keywords or abilities the original unit gained during the battle and any persisting effects that apply to it do not apply to the replacement unit each unit can only be replaced once you cannot replace replacement units there we go Nice and simple. Okay, so now we're just getting into some crunchy additional rules. And this one is guarded heroes. Okay, this is an important thing for your heroes as you play in the game. All heroes that are not monsters or war machines will be able to use the guarded hero ability. And it is split up into uh, like infantry heroes and non-infantry heroes. But you're not gonna be able to do it if you're a monster or war machine, okay? If this hero is within combat range of a friendly unit that is not a hero, so within three inches, Subtract one from hit rolls for shooting attacks that target this hero. If this hero is an infantry unit in addition, they cannot be picked as the target of shooting attacks made by units more than 12 inches away. So this is going to allow your foot characters, you know, your kind of like your wizards on foot and your special priests and stuff to be very, very survivable from long range missile attacks, which is nice. Uh, and so you uh, th that's going to be shooting attacks, don't forget. So this is going to be susceptible to spells and stuff. But importantly, this is a core rule. So this will be something that is true for the whole of the edition. So make sure you remember that. OK, we're going to talk about the end of the turn. Okay, the end of each turn because we've kind of been through everything, right? Like we've we know how to attack, we know how to make saves, we know how to move around, we know how to do fighting, we know how to remove models and assign damage. So now we're here at the end of the turn. This is where we score points. And if you remember about remember from earlier when we talked about how to win, you need to score points at the end of your turn. You need to work out whether or not you complete your battle tactic, which will happen at the end of the turn. And you need to work out whether or not you're holding any objectives and scoring points via doing that, which is all here. Okay, so at the end of the turn is kind of got a few sub phases like a, a couple of sub phases the first sub phase of the end of the turn is the active player can use any abilities with their with end of your turn or the end of any turn timing in the order of their choice then the opponent can do the same use any end of turn or end of any turn in their choice okay so that's done we've done that now so then we go next determine which player controls each objective if any okay we're going to talk about controlled objectives in a moment. And then the active player scores victory points as described in the battle plan. And obviously you work to see whether or not you have controlled, uh, you have uh, done your battle tactic because that's what you're trying to do. All right, objectives. Let's talk about objectives, okay? Many battle plans award victory points for controlling objectives, which we've talked about already, okay? Which are represented by objective markers. Usually, unless otherwise specified, objective markers are round 40 mil wide, model can, uh, and 40 mil wide. Models can move over and end their move on objective markers. If an objective marker is on the border between territories, it is within all those territories, but wholly within none of them. Objective markers don't block visibility. Okay, before we do anything else, it's worth me just mentioning that on the honestwargamer.com, pretty great website if I'm honest, uh, there are some plucky young fellows who are selling some objective markers that are that both have the 40 mil, inch, uh, 40 mil circle in the middle and also the three inch control range from it, 
where you can pick these up and they come in a nice fancy sleeve. You get eight of them, which is super cool. They're on the wargamer.com. But if you are someone who's super interested in faction tokens, they make faction tokens, which kind of look similar to Age of Sigma faction tokens. Uh, here, you can see them. Uh, and they sell those in sets of eight, which you can buy, which is fun and nice. So just in case you're interested and you're like, how will I ever work out how I'm controlling an objective? Well, there you go. There's some good ways to do it. Right. Objectives. Now we know what an objective looks like, and we know that we can buy some objective markers from Swan Gamer. We need to work out how to contest an objective. And I kind of covered this already, but it's super simple. Unless otherwise specified, if an objective is within a model's combat range, so that's three inches, the model is contesting that objective. If any models uh, in a unit are contesting an objective, that unit is contesting the objective. Okay? Each unit can only contest one objective per turn. If a unit would be able to contest more than one objective, its player must pick one of those objectives for it to contest. If both players have more than one unit that would be able to contest more than one objective, before determining objective control, the active player must pick which of those objectives are being contested by their units first, then their opponent does the same. Same as always, whoever's active, they take sequence. So how do you work out objective control? Okay, so actually you can actually control objectives from the start, right? At the start of the first battle round, at the end of each turn, Follow this sequence for each objective in order. Now, why at the start of the first battle round? That means objectives that you're in your objective, you automatically control if you deploy on them at the start of the game. And then you move on and you go and contest other objectives. And the way you do that is you move models onto it, you work out your control score, which is the summation of your control value plus any bonuses or negatives. And then if yours is higher than your opponent's on that objective, you hold the objective. And it will always be your objective, so it's what's called sticky objectives, unless you move away. Uh, unless, sorry, your opponent moves some models on and is able to get a higher control value than you, if that makes sense. So you're constantly testing for control of, the, of an objective at the end of every single turn. End of every single turn, you're testing for control. If it's equal, then if you currently hold it, you still hold it. That's how it works, okay? Terrain control is exactly the same, where you use your control score to control terrain, and you still have to do it within three inches of the terrain feature. However, terrain, unlike objectives, does not remain in your control. So as soon as you move away from it, it's no longer in your control. Whereas objectives remain in your control until your opponent moves some models on it or outscores you on your control value, if that makes sense. And then we get to the end of the battle round. We've done some turns. And we're there. At the end of the battle round, the active player can use any end of battle round abilities. Their opponent could do the same. Each battle plan will specify the number of battle rounds that should be four. If you complete them, then that is the end. And then you work out who's the winner, which is nice. And you are the winner for watching this video this far. Okay, let's get to the coolest phase of Age of Sigmar. Let's talk about magic. So we kind of skipped that, and that's because it requires you to know a few more things for us to get here. So we're going to talk about magic, which obviously you'll do in your hero phase, and you'll also be engaging with your opponent in their hero phase as well. So... You have wizards and you have priests. And we've talked about that before, but at the bottom of their war scroll, it will say that they are a wizard and they're a priest. And in the example of Alariel, which we can see here, you see at the bottom of her war scroll, it says, just there, that she's a wizard three. So that means she has a power level of three. That's important to note. Level three, level two, level one, whatever it is, Lord Change will be a six, whatever. Uh, but they're a power level whatever it is, okay? And what does a power level mean? So power level is basically like a resource that you're able to use in your hero phase and also a resource you can use in your opponent's turn. We'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, and that allows you to do a spell, a prayer, or a banish. Prayers, obviously, are related to priests. If you're a priest one, you can do uh, a priest, okay? So I'm just going to read this in full so you can see it. Each wizard or priest has a power level, shown in brackets after the keyword, wizard two. A wizard or priest power level determines the number of spells, prayers, or banish abilities that they can use per phase in any combination. So it's per phase. Let's also remember that. That's important. In any combination. For example, wizard two unit could use one spell and one banish ability in their commander hero phase that means that's going to refresh going into the next uh player's turn and a different hero phase so for that singular phase you've got a, a resource basically of two to be able to do a spell prayer or banish okay banish is getting rid of manifestations which are endless spells which we'll talk about in a minute and spells are obviously spells okay so how do i do a spell super simple i've got a power level of two i pick a spell spell laws 
I don't know why they say this here. Spell laws are something that you write into your army list. I choose a spell law for my army, and all the wizards in my army know that spell law. So that each one of them, if I've got three wizards, then each one of them can pick each one of those spells out to cast. Now, I, if I cannot cast multiples of the same spell in one hero phase, so I've got three wizards, and there's a spell that I want to cast three times, I can't do it. Not allowed. Only one of my wizards can attempt to cast it one time, unless it has the unlimited keyword. If it has the unlimited keyword, each one of my wizards is going to be able to attempt to cast it. Cool. Okay. The same wizard cannot attempt to cast an unlimited spell more than once. Hope that clears that up for you. Okay. Super easy. All right. Basically, you can always normally cast one, uh, attempt to cast it once, and then unless it's unlimited and you go for it. Nice. Okay, how do I cast a spell? Basically, a spell, like the example on the left-hand side there, you can see is a Mystic Shield. It's got a casting value of 6. I roll 2d6. I add any bonifiers that I've got. Let's say I've got plus 1, and I've rolled a 6. That means it's cast, but because of plus 1, it's a 7. Lovely. Next, if I roll a double 1, uh-oh, womp womp, then I'm going to take d3 more damage, and that wizard cannot use any more spells in that phase. So that's particularly bad for wizards who've got lots of casts like Nagash, and for some reason not a lot of change. Okay, lovely. So you've got to exceed the, the casting value. However, your opponent has ability to make a reaction, and that reaction is called an unbind. As long as that unit is within 30 inches, so a friendly wizard is within 30 inches of the enemy wizard trying to cast a spell, then you can make this reaction. So they're going to declare, I'm going to cast a spell, and then they roll their dice, and then you say, cool, I'm going to try and do an unbind. The number of unbinds you can do is equal to the power level of your uh, wizard. So if you're level two, you can attempt to do two unbinds. This does not affect your ability to cast spells. They're separated. They used to be integrated in Age Sigmar 3. They're now separated away from each other. One is an amount of reactions you can make, and you can do unbinds multiple times, which is an exception to the core rules. And then one is a resource that you use to cast spells. Okay? hope that makes sense. And the way that you unbind a spell is you've got to be within 30 inches, right, of the enemy wizard. You don't have to see... They don't have to be visible, I'm almost certain. And then you roll 2d6. If the roll exceeds the casting roll for the spell, then the spell is unbound and its effect is not resolved. This reaction cannot be used more than once per casting roll. So you can only try to do one unbind against one spell each time. Uh, and don't forget, you have to beat the casting roll. So if my opponent has rolled a 9 to cast, or let's say they've rolled an 8 and they got plus 1 as well, so that's a total of 9, I need to roll a 10 to be able to stop their spell. Super simple. Next section, let's talk about Wololos and prayers. Also, obviously, I baited you all in the comments because I know Nagash ignores miscasts, so I just wanted you all to just leave some comments. <laughs> okay, so for all you Wololo fans out there, prayers. Some of your wizards will, not wizards, some of your characters, heroes, units will be priests of all things, as well as obviously being bedecked investments. Uh, those prayer, those priests are able to do prayers and the number of prayers that they can do will be on, uh, will be in their power level, just like with wizards. And like wizards, they'll have a prayer law that will be on their army list. And like wizards, they will be able to do any of the prayers on there, but only one instance of those prayers per hero phase, unless it's got the unlimited keyword, in which case you can do it multiple times, but it still has to be done across multiple priests. A congregation, if you will, I think. Okay, so how do prayers work? So it's a little bit complex, but super easy, really. What you do is you roll a d6. I would like to do a prayer. Boom, roll a d6. If you roll a 1, the prayer fails, and you remove d3 ritual points from the priest using the prayer, okay? If you don't roll a 1, then you give a number... You've got two choices to make. You give a number of ritual points to the priest equal to the chanting roll. Ritual points can be accumulated over multiple turns. You add the priest's ritual points to the chanting roll. If the chanting roll equals or exceeds the prayer's chanting value at the top right corner, it is answered. To resolve the effect of the prayer, then reset the priest's ritual to zero. The example one that they've shown over there is resurrection, which is a seven. So you can never just roll a d6 and immediately be able to do resurrection. Uh, important note, because a lot of people will be getting this wrong. These two examples, this example spell and this example, example spell and example prayer are just examples. These are are not generic ones that are usable by anyone. That doesn't that doesn't count. 
Okay. So I, if I roll it, if it was a casting value of four, I could roll a d6 and just immediately do it. However, this one is a seven. So what I'll need to do is I'll need to roll and then accumulate those points on my priest to eventually be able to add that accumulated uh, ritual points to be able to cast my prayer. And that's how they work. Okay, so when you write your army list, you, as well as choosing a spell law and a prayer law, you're also going to be able to choose a manifestation law. Again, please watch the video about building an agency in my four army list that I've done. Okay, manifestations are the sets of manifestations. They come in like sets of three or four. And the endless spells, they're like physical objects of magic, are free. Like points-wise, they're free. Obviously, you've got to buy them. Uh, it's Games Workshop. Uh, so you are able to bring them. So you'll have a free manifestation law. And all wizards in your army will know the spells to be able to summon those manifestations to the table. Those manifestations have a health value so there are lots of examples here's an example of a manifestation law this is a universal one that you'll be able to pick for your army you'll choose the twilight sorceries which means you'll know the spells for umbral spell portal geminids and prismatic palisade okay there are multiple different manifestation laws in addition some factions like skaven as an example have their own specific faction specific manifestation law so there's loads of options on what you can choose here all right, we're going to jump over to the Warp Lightning Vortex and look at that as a man as a spell, right? So this is a manifestation that you'll you'll cast, and as you can see, it's got a health value at the top left, and it's also got a save value, and it has a bunch of abilities that it does. All of this is to say that that is how manifestations are brought into your army and also put onto the tabletop. Okay, really easy. Uh, no more than one friendly wizard or priest can attempt to summon the same manifestation per turn. Manifestations are not considered to be units for the following exceptions. So not considered to be units. It's really important. First one, they are treated as if they were units for the purposes of movement, combat range, being in combat and setting up other units. Units can't finish a charge move within half an inch of an enemy manifestation as if it were the target unit. So you can charge manifestations, right? You can use manifestations to screen and zone out deep strikes and redeploys, um, uh, not redeploys, and uh, yeah, deep strikes and, and, and teleports, which is massive. If they have any melee or ranged weapons, they can use the fight and shoot core abilities if they were units, because they basically can attack people. If they have a move characteristic greater than zero, they can use core move abilities if they were units. That's right, the spells can move. If they can be picked as targets of enemy abilities, as if they were, they can be picked as targets of enemy, uh, enemy abilities if they were units. They are not affected by enemy abilities. They do not involve uh, picking targets. So area of effect damage. Damage points can be inflicted on them as if they were units and they can be destroyed. Manifestations that have a move characteristic of zero cannot move for the purposes of movement, combat range, being in combat and setting up other units. They are only treated as if they were units in the charge phase and the combat phase. And lastly, models can move through manifestations but cannot end a move on them. It's fair to say that manifestations are going to manifest a headache in a lot of people. And so we are going to have to go through these in detail and I will make a much more comprehensive video about them in the future when they're all out. Next up, we've got Severed Connection. If the wizard or priest that summoned the manifestation is slain, then that manifestation is removed from the battlefield. Just gone, just removed. And that's a way of getting rid of it. And lastly, we have Banish Manifestations, which again, you're gonna need, you're gonna need a power level to do. And you pick a friendly wizard or priest to use his ability, and you pick a manifestation within 30 inches of them to be the target, then you make a banishment roll of 2d6. If the banishment roll equals or exceeds the banishment value, so again, if we go and look at our warp light and vortex, you can see it's got a banishment value of seven, then uh, it's banished and removed from play. You cannot pick the same manifestations, the target of this ability more than once per turn. The big change here is that this is done in your hero phase and therefore not done in your opponent's hero phase. So you've got a little bit of reduced ability to affect the manifestations. So that's how it works. We're gonna to have to go through this in more detail in a separate video, but you're gonna to need to get yourself some endless spells. Okay, so you're going to have a resource in Age of Sigmar called Command Points, and you're gonna be able to do these things called Command Abilities, which I've referenced before, and we're gonna go through all of this now. Command Points are a limited resource which you're able to gain each battle round. Games Workshop have stated that there is no additional ways to gain Command Points outside of the three examples that I'm gonna talk about, but we'll have to see if that ends up being true. Okay, so Command Points allow you to, allow you to spend them to spend on Command Abilities. So you're gonna talk about generating Command Points now and also using command abilities okay 
Earning command points. At the start of each battle round, including the first, after determining the underdog, each player gains four command points. If there is an underdog, and don't forget an underdog is someone with less victory points than the opponent, they gain an extra command point. At the end of the battle round, the player's command points are reset to zero, uh, and any that have not been used are lost. In addition to this, if you are, when you're building your army lists, if your opponent has more auxiliaries than you do, an auxiliary unit is a unit you choose outside of a regiment, you'll gain an additional command point at the start of the first battle round. In addition to that, if when you write your army list and you're playing 2,000 points, if you have an army list that's 1,950 or less points, you gain an additional command point in the first battle round. In fact, actually, no, sorry, having all auxiliary gives them an additional command point each battle round. A, a, auxiliary gives them additional command point each battle round. And uh, the 1950 or below gives you a first additional uh, command point in the first battle round. So it's very possible that you can have six, uh, six command points in the first battle round and continue to have six battle, uh, command points, sorry, across each turn. So those are command points. Right, using commands. Commands are used in a similar manner to any other ability. However, each unit can only use one command in each phase. Each command can only be used one time by each army in each phase, and you, can, and you must spend a number of command points equal to the command points used. So basically, you can only do it once effectively and a unit can only do something once okay so what are the commands so in the hero phase you've got two and both of them are great but one is better than the other uh, first one is rally uh you pick up for any unit that's not in combat it costs one command point you make six rally rolls of d6 for each four plus so you roll six dice for each four plus that you roll you receive one rally point rally points can be spent in the following ways for each rally point heal one to that unit for each, uh, you can spend a number of rally points equal to the health characteristic of that unit to return a slain model to that unit. And you can spend the rally points in any combination of the above. Unspent rally points are lost. Where it gets super spicy, in my personal opinion, uh, is, you know, you've got a six wound model and you're going to roll six four ups. It's not going to necessarily happen all the time. Don't forget, healing allows you to return uh, health back to a unit effectively. Or uh, this, what this means is, is if I roll six dice and I roll three four ups, I could return a three wound model to a unit but i could not return a six wound model with three wounds left that's not how it works okay super easy and it can only be a slain model exactly can't be a can't be a, a model uh, to add to a, a unit can't do that so that's rally so next up it's magical intervention which is again one command point this is done in the enemy hero phase uh, rally is done in any hero phase, which means in your opponent's hero phase as well. In any hero phase, pick a friendly... So this is done in enemy hero phase, magical intervention. Pick a friendly wizard or priest to use this ability. That friendly unit can use a spell or prayer ability as appropriate as if it were your hero phase. The as if it were your hero phase is really important for the wording uh, down here because lots of the spells say in your hero phase. So now it's going to count as being in your hero phase. If you do so, subtract one from the casting rolls or chanting rolls made as part of that ability. So this means you're going to try and attempt to cast a spell in your opponent's turn. And some spells are completely game-changing, which is good, but there's a negative. Uh, also means that you can potentially try to build up uh, ritual points with your priests and then use them in your turn. So there you go. And it's going to be very effective. People are going to use that a lot. In the movement phase, you have two different command abilities both of them cost one command point first one is redeploy you do this in the enemy movement phase and you pick a friendly unit that is not in combat to use this ability each model in that unit can move up to d6 inches that move cannot pass through or end within the combat range of an enemy unit this is going to be incredibly effective because when you do deep strikes this means that you're going to be able to move d6 inches away okay this is done by any unit and because it's done in the enemy movement phase all your opponent will have done all of their moves and then you will do this so you are going to get to see where they've moved all their models and then attempt to move a unit d6 inches away next up is you have a reaction that you do in the uh, movement phase because you declared a run ability this way you do a move and you add a d6 uh, the unit using the run ability does not roll a dice a random d6 and add it to your move characteristic instead you just add six inches okay nice nice and simple 
Okay, in the shooting phase, uh, you well, in your enemy shooting phase, you can use the covering fire command ability, which costs one command point. Pick a friendly unit that is not in combat to use this ability. Resolve shooting attacks for that unit, but all of the attacks must target the nearest visible enemy unit, and you must subtract one from the hit rolls for those attacks. Feels very strong, probably going to want to do this a lot. In the charge phase, there are uh, two commands uh, that you can do. First one we'll do is really simple, which is a reaction to you declared a charge ability. It costs one command point. The unit uses in the charge ability, you can re-roll the charge roll, okay? So you declare the charge, I'm going to do a charge, and then you say, as a reaction to that, I'm going to re-roll it, and I'm going to spend a command point to do it. This is a change to what it once was, where you would re-roll it after. This is, you get to say that you're going to do it before. The other one, which costs two command points because it's insane, is counter charge, which is done in the enemy charge phase. You pick a friendly unit that is not in combat to use this ability. That unit can use a charge ability as if it were your charge phase. This is going to be really important. Again, they're going to do all of their charges and then you'll do counter charge. And so it's all about the stack when you can do an ability. They'll do all of their charge phase abilities and then you'll do all of your charge phase abilities. But the only one that you'll have to do is this one and you'll only get to do it once. But this is going to be really, really powerful. Okay, the next one is for shooting and combat attacks. You can do it in either phase. It's called all out attack and it costs one command point. Use When a unit has decided to do like either a shooting attack or a combat attack, you can spend one command point and you can add one to hit rolls for attacks made by that unit as a reaction. Okay, this also affects weapons that have the companion weapon ability. There's a similar thing, which is a defensive command. When your opponent declares an attack ability, you can spend a command point, and as a reaction, that unit can add plus one to its save rolls. And lastly, you've got end of turn commands, where you can, sorry, end of turn commands, and you have one called power through, which is one command point, and you pick a friendly unit that charged this turn to use this ability. Then you must pick an enemy unit in combat with it to be the target. The target must have a lower health characteristic than the unit using this ability. So if you're only a one wound uh, unit, you're not going to be able to, one health unit, you're not going to be able to do it, okay? If it D3 more damage on the target, then that unit moving this uh, unit, sorry, that unit move using this ability uh, must move a distance up to its move characteristic. It can pass through and end that move within the combat range of enemy units that were in combat with it at the start of the move, but not those of enemy units. Uh, it does not have to move, uh, end its move in combat. Okay, so basically, you're going to be able to move through units and move out of dodge and then be able to fight, which is great. Uh, so, I love that. That's really good. Uh, that's going to be very, very effective as well. Just for some clarity, just some clarity, the forward to victory, which is the reroll charges, uh, we've just gone back and checked uh, what you're able to do. When you declare that you're going to do a charge, you will immediately roll 2d6. So you will actually do um, the command ability to reroll the charge based on the results. So you will know the results. That's a quick clarification for you. To clear up when any command abilities can be used, especially command abilities used in your opponent's turn, they will be done after your opponent has done all of their abilities in that turn. That's when they'll be used. If they're reactions, it will be a reaction to a specific ability being declared. But as the example of covering fire, where I do a shooting attack in my opponent's shooting phase, it'll be after when they've done all of their shooting attacks because they'll do all of their abilities first, then I'll do my abilities. That's how it works. The last little bit that we need to talk about is terrain. And I personally am going to make a much more in-detail video about terrain because I love terrain. And terrain can get quite complex and quite confusing. Um, I don't think the rules are particularly overt, uh, but I'd like to talk more about them in the future and make a more a condensed video. But the one thing I should talk about is faction terrain because it's going to affect lots of different armies. And some factions have special terrain features called faction terrain. They are not considered to be units with the following exceptions. In the charge phase and the combat phase, they are treated as if they were units for the purposes of movement, which means you can charge them. Combat range and being in combat units can finish a charge move within half an inch of enemy faction terrain as if it were a unit so you can charge it they can be picked as targets of enemy abilities as if they were units they are not affected by enemy abilities that do not involve picking targets so this does mean you can pick them to do a spell against them you can pick them to do shooting against them uh, and you can pick them to do combat against them damage points can be inflicted on them as if they were units and they can be destroyed and boom 
One hour, 55 minutes uh, to go through the core rules. There's loads of these little sections that I personally would love to do deeper and bigger videos about. Uh, and I understand that just reading through the rules and explaining them um, has been a lot. Thank you for sticking with me for two hours. I hope you've enjoyed it. And uh, let me know what you think. Any questions that you have or you don't think I've covered, please do leave them in the comments. And probably what I'll do is I'll take a bunch of them and I'll make a separate video like, hey, uh, you know, like these are frequently asked questions. What can I answer? And then I'll read through them all and and I'll do that. Um, and hopefully I'll be able to answer all those questions. But I just want to thank Twitch Chat, who I've done this live with. Everyone on this one game of Patreon who helps support me in creating content. Uh, I want to thank El Mariachi, uh, and I want to thank everyone else for all of the support and being able to produce all of this for you and hopefully bring this in a good and informative way. So instead of just someone just reading through it and not understanding what it means, I've taken the time. I've reviewed every single rules interaction that Games Workshop have announced. Uh, I've run. I've reviewed every single faction uh, preview that they've talked about. So I feel like this is the most kind of like condensed and well articulated information can be obviously without the game being out so i hope it's been good uh, that's what i hope to create let me know if it has been let me know what things i can do in the future to improve it because i'd like to be able to obviously improve stuff in the future thanks for watching i appreciate you all see you soon and thanks for being honest war gamers